Good morning, and I welcome everyone to the 20th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Once again, thank the Broadcasting Office for their work helping organise it this week. I ask everyone to ensure their mobile phones are in silent. And today we have received apologies from Annie Wells and also from Gail Ross, who is a new addition to the committee. Jeremy Balfour is here as a Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party substitute. Welcome back, Jeremy. For Agenda Item 1, I welcome Keith Brown to the committee. I take the opportunity to place on record first my thanks to Annabel Ewing and Kenneth Gibson, who have left the committee to take up different committee roles. Now I ask Keith Brown to indicate whether he has any relevant interests to declare. I have no relevant interest to declare, Convener. Thank you very much. Today's main business will be an evidence session on building regulations for fire safety in Scotland. But first to item two, we have consideration of whether to take agenda item six and seven in private. Item six is consideration of evidence heard at today's meeting, and item seven is consideration of our work, work programme. As we are meeting remotely, rather than asking whether everyone agrees, I will instead ask if anyone objects. If there is silence, I will assume you are content. Does anyone object? Thank you very much. Then that is agreed. Item six and seven will be taken in private. Agenda item three is an evidence session on building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. This session forms part of the committee's ongoing work to monitor the Scottish Government's response to the tragic events which occurred in Grenfell in 2017 and related issues. Today's focus is mainly on the issue of homes with external wall systems and problems that have been risen in connection with this in some cases. Today, I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Stephen Garvin, Head of Building Standards, Scottish Government, and Ross Lindsay from More Homes Division. I'm grateful to you for taking time to answer our questions today, and thank you for your recent letter responding to the questions the committee had raised in advance of this meeting. I also want to put on record that the committee has received a recent response from Local Authority Building Standards Scotland. In a moment, I will invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. I want to remind members that I will then call them in a pre-arranged order notified to you by the clerks. Each committee member will have around nine minutes to ask their questions, and I will let you know when you have one minute of your time left. Please give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate the mic- your microphones before beginning to ask your question or to provide an answer. I would like to also welcome today Graham Simpson, a former committee member for this agenda item. I will allow Graham in after all committee members have asked their questions and any possible supplementaries at the end. Minister, if you invite Mr Garvin or Mr Lindsay to answer any questions, I'd be grateful if you could state this clearly for broadcasting's benefit. And I now invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. I'm not sure if I'll be able uh, to tell you anything uh, clearly today. Um, I've been out in the garden and my hay fever uh, is playing up a little, so apologies for any hoarseness. Um, can I thank you um, for the invitation to attend the committee uh, to update you on the progress of the Scottish Government's implementing in fire safety? Uh, and I'd like to provide an update of where we currently are. Uh, the impact of the pandemic, uh, of course, has had a profound impact on the work of Parliament, government, uh, and stakeholders. Uh, and like others, uh, we rapidly and significantly uh, reshaped our resources and governments to deal with the pandemic, both in terms of initially the lockdown uh, and, of course, now our framework out of it. Uh, and I've worked closely with the construction industry uh, to enable a safe restart and to develop a recovery plan, uh, which was published last week. Uh, I've also instructed officials to bring together a fire safety review panel uh, to to see uh, and examine how we can uh, ban uh, the highest risk cladding materials from taller buildings and to look again at the role of BS 8414. Um, The working group convener will be made up uh, of appropriate experts and uh, with the use of the most up-to-date evidence available uh, to provide me with recommendations uh, for further changes uh, to the building standards. In March, um, I set up a technical working group uh, to uh, oversee the development of advice on external wall systems. Uh, the draft Scottish Advice Note 
uh, is now out for consultation. Uh, to gain feedback, uh, my officials are engaging with key organisations, and there are public webinars where anyone can join the discussion. In addition, uh, you will remember that we introduced changes to building standards in October last year uh, to make buildings in Scotland even safer, uh, and further uh, uh, measures will be introduced uh, early next year. Uh, sprinklers will then be required in all new social houses, all new flats, uh, and some new multi-occupancy homes. I know today that the committee will want to concentrate on cladding issues. And I want to make clear that I remain very concerned uh, about continuing issues uh, in relation to mortgage lending and the difficulties that some people have experienced in selling their properties. And I do not underestimate the personal impact on people and their families, and I understand the stress and the anxiety that this will be causing. The establishment of the Ministerial Working Group on Mortgage and Cladding earlier this year was a route to examine how government and key stakeholders could examine solutions to these issues. The committee will understand the complexity and the varying interests involved, personal, professional, commercial and public, in finding resolution. You are also very aware uh, that not all of the levers are in the hands uh, of this Parliament. The Ministerial Working Group met on the 28th of April, uh, where a full and frank discussion uh, on all of the issues took place. The out outcome of that was to set up four subgroups, uh, led by stakeholders, to look at different stages in the process obtaining the EWS1 form, using the report and the process after the form is completed, and the long-term approach and legislative needs. The group will meet again later this month to consider proposed work plans and timescales for the various groups. My priority through the working group is to be clear about the extent of the problem that needs to be solved, to get clarity on what is a moving situation and to develop practical solutions. The group, as I said, will meet again later uh, this month to look at all of those work streams and to set timescales. And it is clear, convener, that no one single body can solve this problem. Uh, we need all others to play their part and act in line with their responsibilities. Uh, there is a real willingness uh, from those represented on the working group to come together on solutions, uh, and we work, need to work towards agreement on what is needed uh, from lenders and insurers for uh, greater transparency for all. Uh, and I want the working group to focus on all of that very quickly. Finally, convener, I remain concerned. Uh, with the lack of engagement uh, of the UK Secretary of State on this matter. Um, as the committee will remember, I have written uh, a number of times uh, asking to work together to resolve this issue, uh, and I have had only a minimum of response. Uh, it is clear uh, that taking cognizance of the complexity of devolved and reserved issues uh, we must have a joint response, and I hope that we will see cooperation from the Secretary of State. I am now happy to take questions from the committee, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I have got a couple of questions. One of the things that comes across loud and clear is the issue that people are having with the EWS1 forum. Uh, it is clearly confusing. Is there a set and agreed universal process, or are you looking forward, uh, looking towards trying to create one? Because at this stage, people don't seem to understand best how it works. Um, convener, uh, across the the UK, um, there are difficulties uh, for homeowners in obtaining EWS one forms. 
Um, and I think, you know, this is not a Scotland only pro problem in terms of getting these forms. But I'll come back to some of the differences that there are here, if you don't mind. Um, the form itself um, was designed in the expectation that there would be a single form per building. Um, and it was also designed with the English in mind. Um, so where the norm is in England, of course, to have a, a freehold system where somebody owns the uh, building um, uh, and leaseholders uh, have uh, uh, ownership over individual flats on long leases. Um, in these cases, in uh, south of the border, a single person can be identified as the responsible person, uh, and they have the authority to commission uh, an EWS1 report. Um, our different property tenure uh, system here uh, means that uh, there can be many um, individual owners in a building, and then you have a situation where uh, uh, an appropriate proportion of the building owners, sometimes 100%, uh, needs to agree to the introduction of the EWS form before it can be commissioned. Um, however, you know there are instances that uh, we know of uh, where some lenders are accepting forms produced in respect of a, a single flat here in Scotland, um, uh, which also makes comment on the wider building. Um, and what we have seen uh, with that lack of clarity and consistency um, are the real difficulties that homeowners are experiencing here. This is um, a system that has been set up um, without any uh, consultation with ourselves or with the experts here in Scotland. Uh, and what we can see is a lack of consist consistency, a lack of clarity. Um, which is causing confusion here in Scotland, but it would also be fair to say that there are difficulties south of the border too um, around about this entire system. Yeah, but we'll do our best to get the UK government minister to uh, speak to the, the committee at some stage as well. But you, you talked about some lenders are allowing it and some lenders are, are not. Can you tell me? What clarity you've had from them about when and how they apply this EWS one? Well, I, I don't think there is any clarity. That is the problem, um, con convener. Um, well, let, let me you know. The end the let me reword that. Is, is what what is the minimum that these uh, lenders are looking for then? The ones that are allowing it, and why then are others not? Um. Convener, I really can't answer that in any depth either. Um, I, I, one of the things which concerns me most about all of this is that there is no universal process. Um, and I want um, the working group uh, with RICS, the lenders, and the insurers represented. Um, I know, for example, um, Convener, um, that, you know, um, many uh, of uh, our colleagues, including myself, um, have had situations where lenders have asked for EWS1 forms for buildings which are below 18 metres, for example. Um, and yet, we haven't had the clarity around about why they're asking that. And what we actually need is for a universal process to be agreed uh, with what folk want, what they are looking for. Um, and then applying that, it is very difficult for us to even try and find a solution unless we actually know what the problems are and how we can solve them in a logical basis. So we we really need everybody starting from the same position uh, in all of this. And I do hope that the working group can get to that point of clarity where there is a universal process uh, where we can work together. Um, with the four other governments uh, across the UK to come to some agreement uh, around about all of that, um, so that we can do our level best uh, for those homeowners here in Scotland, but also elsewhere, who are in some real difficulty here. Could, who, who, in your view, uh, should decide what building should be subject to this form? 
Convene, I never quite caught what you said there. Yeah, and, and and your view, who should decide what building should be subject to the EWS one? Well, at, at, at the end of the day, um, what we have is a situation where the lenders um, and the insurance companies um, have uh, have said that there are difficulties round about this. Now, what what we need from them is what difficulties there are and where they think those difficulties lie. I have no control. Um, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, has no control over the lenders um, and the um, insurers. That's reserved to the UK government. I do not know uh, what influence the UK Secretary of State has brought to bear um, in terms of all of this. Uh, and what I would want to know is how can we work together, all of us, industry and government, to, to look at exactly where the difficulties lie, what is required here, and what universal process can we put in place to get this right, uh, to ensure um, that you know we get out of the position that we're currently in, where homeowners um, find themselves in real difficulty. Just let me get this clear, Minister. Are, are you saying that this problem cannot be solved? Unless we get the UK minister to speak to the lenders and insurance uh, companies, I, I think, convener, that we can do a job of work here in terms of the ministerial working group talking to lenders and insurers uh, to try and get things right. However, I think um, in order to get this absolutely spot on and not do half a job, but to do the full job, what we require. Um, is uh, the UK Secretary of State um, to, to cooperate more um, uh, and to help us um, reach a solution uh, which is workable for all. Okay, just finally, uh, very briefly, I, I suppose, uh, when would you expect A, the subgroups and B, the ministerial groups to come back with any kind of reports? Um, Convener, um, I, I think that all of that is always very difficult uh, to, to give timescales on. However, I would want a resolution to this um, as soon as we possibly can. Um, you know, I have constituents, um, as have many others, who find themselves uh, in really uh, difficult situations at this moment. Um, where they are unable to gain clarity about what is required um, to sell their property. Now, obviously, I want that resolved for my constituents uh, and for the constituents of all of my colleagues. Uh, we need to get resolution to this as soon as we possibly can. However, um, what I would also say is that in order to get that rule, we do need full cooperation um, from others to get to that universal process, um, but you know my uh, uh, ambition would be to to get this uh, sorted as soon as we possibly can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, convener. Can I first of all draw members' attention to my register of interest in relation to my former employment for SFHA? Um, Minister, um, it's been very good to read your response to us and to see the progress that's being made in the working parties that you've set up. Um, can I ask about um, what knowledge you have about the UK fund that was established um, that owners in England can now apply for in terms of being able to get remedies to their properties? Have you made any progress in considering what would be relevant in Scotland and what the experience has been and whether it has actually helped make any progress and cut through the logjam that you, you mentioned in your opening remarks. Convener, um, I think that um, we will continue to look um, at the, the, what has happened in terms of the UK fund. and I know that there have been some difficulties around about um, that fund. Um, and I would say um, to the committee um, that I'm sympathetic uh, to the calls for government funding. 
um, and I'm open to this. However, what I would expect um, is that uh, there should be um, uh, movement by others um, to help with cost, uh, depending on particular circumstances. Um, and I'll give you a, an example, um, because the two buildings, the only two uh, uh, housings that we had in Scotland that were ex extensively clad uh, with uh, ACM PE here in Scotland were at Glasgow Harbour. And um, the developer, uh, Taylor Wimpy, uh, have started work to reme remediate those buildings at their cost. No cost to government, no cost to the owners of the building, and that is the right thing for developers to do, um, and plaudits to Taylor Wimpy for doing that. I'm quite sure um, that no one will want us to spend government money on anything if we believe that others are responsible um, for remediation. And what I would urge developers uh, to do in circumstances where homeowners find themselves in some difficulty is to look at their responsibility uh, to follow the lead uh, of Taylor Wimpy. What I, uh, I should also say is, of course, that those two buildings um, are nothing compared to um, the extensive use uh, of uh, ACMPE that there has been south of the border. And I would remind the committee um, that that material uh, should not have been used since 2005 changes in regulations, and that's important. Um, but I would reiterate, um, convener, um, that I'm sympathetic to the calls um, for government funding, and I am open to this, but we have to look at all of what is required. And beyond that, we also have to look at those who are responsible for some of this actually getting uh, their hands and their own pooches and paying for remediation work. Can I say I don't disagree with the fact that where there is an obligation in terms of the builders that that, that they make that contribution. What I was um, thinking of, Minister, is can we cut through the chase in terms of the logjam? Because I know from the evidence we've had to the committee, um, the difficulty about the EWS one form is owners paying for it, um, being able to get an all building approach. Um, and the issue of professional indemnity. So there's clearly a logjam here, and it's thinking of what, what you could do in Scotland or what we could do to try and cut through that, um, and trying to think of what the solutions could be, because we've got a Scottish solution to tenement repairs, which the government came up with, um, because you've got an ownership issue there as well. And I'm just wondering if that kind of thinking could get us to at least cut to the chase where we could get analysis of the buildings done and homeowners could at least know where, know where they are and potential buyers could know where they are and we could focus on where works are actually needed because that appears to be the log jam even though you've made progress in terms of analysing buildings and their condition it's, it's how we pull all that together. Uh, so we could make um, progress uh, on that with some fresh thinking, Minister. Convener, that's one of the areas that the working group um, will look at, um, and um, you know I, I think the key thing here uh, in all of this is what are the difficulties, what are the solutions, uh, and you know I'm more than willing to to look at almost anything. Some of this may actually require a legislative solution. I hope that's not the case, um, and some folk are already calling for legislative solutions. Um, uh, to, to move uh, uh, some uh, some of the th way that we do things uh, towards the way that they do things south of the border, I think that would be unwise, um, and I think would have a huge amount of unintended consequences. And the last thing that I would want to see, and I'm sure, uh, most members of the committee, if not all members of the committee, uh, would want to uh, move to a freehold leasehold system, which is just um, uh, full of problems. Um, for folk, but that's some of the things that some of folk have suggested. Um, what we need to do is we we need to know um, what buildings are subject to EWS uh, one forms, uh, and we will then know what the extent of the problem is. Uh, on the logjam, 
uh, I do think that we need to help. Uh, and that's why, you know, I come back to the point that I made to the convener around about finding a universal process um, that works for all. And I hope that we can move as swiftly as possible uh, through the working group and the subgroups uh, to see um, what we can do in terms of shaping that universal process. Again, um, I would reiterate that in doing so, um, we are going to require cooperation um, from a lot of people. Yeah, I, I agree very much. We don't want to do something that would actually make things worse, but it's just thinking through what the solutions might be, Minister. I realise that we need to get everybody to think about that. I mean, one of the things suggested is to take the inventory that you've done and then to try and start feeding through the information that comes through the EWS1 information and to make sure that that information is available to everybody. Is that something you're looking at? Again, it's about trying to break the log jam and trying to get all those involved in the process to see that everybody's an interest in getting a solution here so that owners can move forward and people are not stuck in their, their homes forever. Um, convener, um, we have offered to share information with stakeholders um, around about all of this. Um, you know, we took step at a very early stage uh, to put together an inventory. That has not been um, a, an easy job of work, um, and I'd like to put on my on record my thanks uh, to local authorities in particular um, for their efforts. Um, and you know, as we move forward, you know, we will see on an annual basis an update um, to um, that um, register, which I think is useful. So, the very simple answer to Ms. Boyack there is yes. Um, we have offered to share information with stakeholders from that. Thank you. Have I got time for just one brief question, um, Eddie, committee convener? Sure, yeah. But there's clearly an issue about the number of qualified staff to be able to undertake this EWS one work. Is there anywhere the Scottish Government can help just to kickstart that process or help fund it? Thank you. Um, convener, again, that's something that I'm open to to looking at. Uh, you know, this is uh, highlights uh, uh, the the real difficulty um, of introducing something without consultation. Um, the fact that um, that form has been introduced without um, actually checking, first of all, uh, whether there are the qualified people to carry out the checks that are required for it, shows um, that this has not been particularly well thought out, in my opinion. Um, and that lack of cooperation um, leads to these real difficulties, uh, and that is uh, one of the reasons why, um, you know, in all of this. Um, there needs to be a, a four-government um, approach here, in my opinion, uh, for many of these things, um, because you know it may well be uh, one of the governments tries to put in a solution to this, um, and then we find that there are no personnel uh, to actually uh, carry out the work that's required. So again, what I would uh, would would ask. Um, is that the UK government, the Secretary of State, um, uh, actually um, uh, comes together with all of us to try uh, uh, and sort out of what is a problem for all. I, I know that um, my officials are, are, are uh, in talks on a regular basis um, uh, across um, the, the, the four governments to, to try and gain cooperation there. I think we need to do that at ministerial uh, level as well, um, and of course, in all of this, uh, we're also reliant on the likes of uh, RICS, um, uh, you know, in terms of their determination um, around about uh, all of this too, in terms of qualification. Um, you know, we we will continue to talk to RICS. They are part of the working group and the subgroups, uh, and hopefully, we can uh, make progress there too. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. Can I just follow on from the 
EWS work. Uh, you identified there with the, the previous question uh, that there seems to be uh, a lack of qualified staff uh, who are able to deal with the cladding, and that's specifically about their knowledge and training. And that's come out in witnesses who've told us that uh, to the committee. So the government has identified that as an issue. Uh, so can I ask, what are the Scottish government doing to ensure that there is full access to that experience and that expertise that is needed across the construction industry here in Scotland? Uh, convener, um, as I uh, pointed out in my earlier answer to Ms Boyack, um, uh, across the UK, uh, across the whole UK, uh, the number of appropriately qualified professionals uh, to produce the EWS1 form is low. Um, there is no central register um, of consultants able to do this work. Um, however, uh, given the different designations used by uh, the different professional uh, bodies, uh, work is required, in my opinion, uh, to determine who is competent uh, to do uh, the inspections of external walls. Uh, again, um, as I said to Ms Boyack, uh, the RICS review um, is considering who is competent to do this work, do these inspections, uh, and they are working with other professional bodies on this. Uh, uh, it's the RICS um, for doing this work. But beyond that, I think that there is a job for governments here too, um, uh, and not just uh, what we are doing in our working group. I think that you know we need to have cooperation. With the UK government, with the Welsh government, uh, with the Northern Irish government, around about this too, um, in order to get that absolutely right. Um, and I know um, that Mr. Stewart's colleagues um, have previously um, tried to be helpful uh, in getting the UK government to engage on this. And I would be very, very appreciative uh, if Mr. Stewart and his colleagues would do so once again. I think it's in all of our interest, uh, whether uh, we're in Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, or Wales, um, to get this right um, for those folks who are currently suffering uh, in limbo um, because they cannot uh, um, move on uh, from properties. Thank you, Minister. I, I give you that assurance that I certainly will uh, now that I'm back in this new role. Uh, in local government to engage with yourself and with my, my counterparts. Can I then move on to the area about zero value? Now, there's been lots of issues uh, uh, occurring with owners who have zero value homes uh, seeking to develop solutions. Uh, now, they don't appear to be part of uh, the working group. So can I ask, they've obviously fed into what's going on here, and how have the Scottish Act government acted on their suggestions, if there have been any suggestions from owners who are in zero-valued properties, uh, and how you have responded to them uh, with that process? Um, I, I'll come into de at some depth on zero-valuation in, in a, a minute, if I, I may, convener. But let me um, uh, talk about owners, first of all. Um, uh, my officials are, are now back working on this. Um, and you know, people have been moved during the course of the pandemic. Um, and one of my key people um, was actually uh, off uh, for a, a long period of time with COVID. Uh, but we are now strength strengthening it, strengthening the team. That's a word that I probably shouldn't have attempted there. Um, in order uh, to move forward on this front, um, and officials uh, um, with owners. Um, in the past few weeks, um, and I have asked owners uh, to give evidence at the next meeting of the working group. Beyond that, um, I have agreed with officials that I will meet with the chair um, of the High Rise uh, Scotland Action Group um, in the near future. 
Uh, I also uh, am aware um, that a number of groups affected uh, have sent me um, their ideas um, for possible solutions to all of this. Uh, what I can assure the committee um, is that myself, my officials, um, and the working group will look at all of those ideas, uh, some of which have, are pretty comprehensive. Folk have put in uh, a fair bit of work, uh, and we will look at the practicality of the solutions that people have put forward. Uh, I should also say to the committee, in terms of um, responses to owners, um, you, you know, I take all of this so seriously, and I want to see exactly what is being said by people. I am signing off every single letter from owners who are writing to me about the solutions, uh, about the difficulties that they have, and are suggesting solutions. So, you know, I can give the committee assurance that we will bring uh, owners into play, and we will look at the solutions that they put forward. Let me turn to, to, to the zero valuation aspect of all of this. Um, and f f first of all, it, it, it may be helpful to, to clarify that according to uh, RICS, zero or nil valuations are used in the process of valuing a property for mortgage lending purposes, where a value, valuer is unable to provide a value at that moment in time. Um, for example, when the valuer's inspection uh, takes place uh, due to un uh, insufficient information being av available. Um, and often, you know, uh, at that point, uh, a null valuation signals that the lender requires further information uh, before a valuation can be made. Um, that is rather than the property being unsellable. However, in cases uh, of properties with external wall cladding, um, in order to provide the additional information required, a satisfactory report on the cladding is required, uh, and now that is a EWS1 form. can be provided lenders will not provide mortgage lending for the property, and that, of course, acts as a barrier uh, to most purchasers. Um, and it's, uh, there's been questions around about how is all of this affecting the market. And, and I should say, convener, that that is difficult to gauge at this moment. Um, uh, because uh, of evidence, uh, uh, evidence that we don't have, uh, because uh, of the shutdown in the market during the course of the pandemic, and because this process um, is still quite early uh, in in terms of inception. Uh, and again, you know, I've asked uh, 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 that we get the evidence. Uh, on all of this as soon as we possibly can. That is a priority um, for me, um, and I've asked that we have evidence of this brought to the next meeting um, of the, the working group. Thank you, Minister. And that, that, that shows very much how you are taking the matter very serious, and I think that's important to give that assurance out there to the industry, but also to the stakeholders and homeowners uh, that are in this situation. So, can I just ask the final question about uh, how you are dealing with and, and supporting uh, people who, in good faith, uh, bought properties and they are now not in a position to get the EWS certificate uh, because uh, of the way that the whole process has, has moved forward. And they took that in good faith because that was what the standards and the building standards system provided at that time for them. Uh, convener, I'm very sympathetic uh, um, the plight of homeowners uh, at this moment, um, and you know, in order for us to do uh, what we need need to do to help them out, the key thing um, in all of this is to get all of this process sorted, um, and to get a universal process in place which everybody understands, where everybody knows where they stand. 
uh, and where we can look to see um, what other additional help may be required to get people out of what are very, very difficult circumstances. But my assurance to the committee is um, that we will continue to um, listen uh, to homeowners and where people, and there are a number of them, um, have uh, sent us uh, proposals in terms of possible solutions, uh, we will look at all of that. Um, and you know, in so doing uh, and bringing all of this together, uh, what we will need to do next um, is to look at uh, how we remediate, uh, what needs to be done there, and you know, as I said earlier, although um, you know it's uh, it's something that I would prefer not to do um, if we don't have to, but if we need to, um, that also means looking at legislation uh, in order to provide. Um, the comfort that is required. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, uh, Andy Whiteman. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, convener, um, and thanks for the minister coming along this morning. I think I should preface my remarks. Um, I, I, as the minister knows, I've been convening a group um, of, of experts looking at this, and it, it's clear by now we're a year into this that the EWS form process is working well for many building owners, and they are securing lending, and they are being able to sell property. So I think it is important to say that. I am um, a little bit bemused by the Minister's constant focus on the UK Government. This is a pattern uh, he has established over appearances at this uh, committee. EWS form is a private arrangement between insurers and surveyors, um, and it is fundamentally about risk, because lenders do not know whether these buildings are safe, and therefore want some assurance that they are safe before lending, and likewise uh, in, in uh, uh, insurers as well. Given that lenders and insur insurers are perfectly entitled to choose who they give lending and insurance to, can the minister give us a little bit more clarity about what he thinks the UK government can do about this, um, given that it is not really minded to tell people and force people to lend if they do not want to lend and they think the risk is too great? Well, I think the simple answer um, to Mr. Whiteman's question there um, is that at this moment in time, um, insurance and lending regulation is reserved uh, um, and will influence directly um, uh, these industries, uh, whereby um, the UK government can. Um, and obviously, the UK government uh, have taken a number of steps. Um, uh, in recent times uh, around about this, um, obviously, to try and satisfy their interests um, in getting this right. Uh, my understanding um, that the Minister, Lord Greenhay, um, held a round table um, in recent times um, with um, industry representatives, but there were no one, there was no one from the devolved governments um, at that meeting. Uh, and I think it would be very useful um, for us to have knowledge of what is going on across the, go the board. Um, uh, you know, I want to have good relationships here um, uh, to resolve this, because my key interest in all of this um, is not to pick political fights or anything like that. My key interest uh, is to help those folks out there who find themselves stuck at this moment. And Mr. Whiteman is right. Some folk have managed to get out of all of this, but as he knows, uh, and as others on the committee and elsewhere in Parliament know, there are a number of folks who are in real difficulties here, including some of my constituents. Now, what I do not want is a situation where you know we find half a solution, um, and we don't find the whole solution uh, because we haven't had the cooperation of others. I want good relationships, not only. Um, with the UK government, with the other devolved governments to resolve this. I'm also trying to ensure that we have the best possible relations uh, with the professional groups um, and to find out where their sticking points are so that we can do what we can um, to um, uh, resolve uh, these difficulties. Uh, and what I would say to uh, Mr. Whiteman. Um, and to others in the committee who have engaged on this, I appreciate the fact um, that they have been involved in this. Um, you know, Mr. Whiteman talked about um, the um, the group that he convened 
you know, uh, my officials have been to, to some of those meetings. And, you know, we will continue um, uh, to cooperate uh, in that regard because I'm not interested in the party politics of, of this. I'm not interested in the constitutional politics of this. I just want a solution for those folks that find themselves in real, real trouble at this moment in time. Okay, thanks. No, that's helpful. And I certainly the group's grateful for the ministers, officials, and engaging with that group. Um, one of the uh, we've had it a year now, so there have been a lot of building inspections going on, and um, information has been given to me from surveyors who are looking at these buildings, and indeed have surveyed hundreds of them. And when I say surveyed hundreds of them, they've looked at a uh, they've been commissioned by a particular owner, but obviously they've looked at the whole building. The whole building is the essentially uh, one one unit. They've identified 20 to 30 buildings in Scotland that are, quote, fundamentally not compliant with building standards in place at the time of construction. They found that EWS forms are being signed off with an option A, A1, which is a complete green light. Again, for buildings which, quote, are, fun, are fundamentally dangerous properties, and they have identified quite a number of fraudulent EWS forms in circulation. My question is, given that we know which buildings, or the industry knows, individuals in the industry know which buildings are dangerous, have been identified as dangerous, what is the government's response to that? And how is it going to make sure that everyone in those buildings, all owners, know that they're living in buildings that are fundamentally not compliant with building standards and where they may be fundamentally dangerous? Um, convener, first of all, I would say to Mr. Whiteman, uh, I would be very grateful for any evidence in this that he wishes to pass on uh, to myself uh, and to my officials. Um, I should say to the committee, um, that there have been 1,100, 1,100 EWS forms uh, across the UK, uh, and we have asked um, UK Finance um, for a Scottish breakdown of those forms, uh, and we do not have a Scottish breakdown of those forms at this moment in time. Um, if Mr Whiteman uh, has managed to gather up evidence uh, from around about some of these issues, um, then we will look very closely um, at what are um, very serious allegations here. Uh, but you know, I, I would reiterate that at this moment uh, we do not even have a Scottish breakdown from UK finance uh, in terms of those EWS one forms. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. I, I certainly will be in, in, in touch on that. Um, regard, and I, I should point out for the record that my understanding is the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, have been notified of all of, of that. Um, there is one um, issue that I'm sure the working group will be looking at, and that's the Title Conditions Act 2003, particularly the Development Management Scheme Order 2009 that created a default management scheme for developments that enable factors to instruct works without consent for health and safety reasons. Um, now, given that many of these properties have been constructed since um, the 2003 um, Act was passed and the Management Scheme Order uh, was passed. There seems to be a problem with the Factors Act in terms of its code of conduct, where they're saying it's difficult to do that. Um, could I ask the Minister to urgently look at that? Because it seems there is a remedy already existing in law, but there's a little bit of confusion as to Factors' powers to instruct those works. And when I say instruct the works, I'm talking about instructing a survey of the whole building. There may still be problems as a consequence of that survey, but at least you have one survey that has been instructed, and therefore we have information, and that information critically will be available to all building owners. So it will be a major step forward. So I could urge the Minister to have a look at that as a matter of priority, because it seems if we can deal with some of this under existing legislation, obviously we shouldn't be continuing to explore what further legislation might be required. Um, convener uh, officials have been going through previous uh, legislation uh, with a fine tooth comb um, to find <clears throat> solutions and remedies. Uh, what uh, I uh, will, without doubt, do um, is ask officials to explore um, Mr. Whiteman's suggestions uh, to see if, uh, if what his belief is um, is actually um, uh, the, 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 the reality. 
Um, you know, I um, uh, would reiterate again, um, you know, if people, if anyone thinks that there are um, solutions that exist in current legislation, I'm willing to, to look at that. But I would assure the committee and Mr Whiteman um, that my officials have already been uh, through uh, a, a, lot, a lot of existing legislation uh, to fight, try and find possible remedies. But we'll write back to the committee um, around about the point that Mr Whiteman has made, but we will look at that most definitely. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to move on, Andy. Okay. Uh, Keith, Keith Brown, welcome to the Keith. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. Obviously, I am uh, new to this uh, issue. Although I have to say that the issue of the complete non-responsiveness of the UK government to requests either from committees or ministers seems to be a pattern on the other committees I'm involved in in the Scottish Parliament. It really is uh, the limit when you can't get responses or any cooperation. I'm a bit surprised by Andy Whiteman's eagerness to absolve the UK government, but that's obviously his issue. Um, the minister has mentioned previously. As I understand it, that the committee has been discussing calls for possible legislation um, to, to fix the need to obtain um, an ESW1. Um, and I just wonder if the minister could say what he believes. He mentioned some of the concerns he'd have about going down that route earlier on, but what he believes are the challenges presented by trying to take forward that legislation. Um. I can say that um, I, I agree with Mr. Brown around about uh, the lack of cooperation. Um, in fairness, um, uh, in in terms of uh, the 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 one uh, decent ish response that I received back from Robert Jenrick, the UK Secretary of State, um, that uh, came after the prompting um, of Mr. Simpson. And I'm grateful to Mr. Simpson for for that. And you know, I hope that Mr. Stewart, Mr. Simpson, um, and Mr. Balfour, who are at this meeting today, uh, will once again use their influence to try and help us find solutions. Cooperation uh, here, I think, is essential because although we have difficulties here, there are difficulties right across uh, the UK. Uh, surely, it's in everybody's interest um, to actually get this right. Um, I, I think that. Um, uh, you know, in terms of legislation itself, um, you know, um, sometimes legislation um, is seen as a quick or easy fix, uh, and sometimes there are a huge amounts of unintended consequences. It's like the suggestion that has been made to me, um, you know, that we should look um, at the um, uh, the English system in terms of building owners. Um, in terms of freehold and leasehold, uh, well, we all know the horror stories that exist south of the border uh, with that system, um, and yet some folks see that as a simple solution to deal uh, with this particular problem. The unintended consequences of moving along that line, um, I think, would be horrendous um, for all. Um, the other scenario, and Mr. Whiteman um, pointed out um, factors there. Um, and, and factors, um, you know, may um, be a solution if we were to change legislation, or you know, it, 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 it may well require just tweaks. But you know, there are risks there as well um, in terms of people who don't have factors or people who lose factors, and again, that could create gaps. So. In terms of looking at legislative solutions, if that is what is required, and it may not be the case, we have to be very careful in terms of catching all, but at the same time, uh, you know, not setting up a, a, a solution which may have real unintended consequences, uh, which have other problems that we have to deal with in the future. But you know, we will look at all of this. I suppose then um, I understand the frustration coming across the minister's response that the different interactions of two different governments, one of whom seems to wish to stand back from this, and also the issues of lending of insurers, the different elements which come together in relation to this. I understand how problematic that is. But if I suppose the bottom line is for the minister, does he believe that legislation is going to be essential and? 
to the extent that he doesn't, and I hear some of his reservations, what does he think the solution uh, might be? And is there a solution that can be reached which does not involve an unwilling participant like the UK government? Is there a potential solution through that, or is it going to have to require their, their active um, assistance and input? Um, Convener, um, I, I mentioned in an earlier answer um, the, the, the fact that the UK Minister Lord Greenhay um, held a round table where no one from the devolved uh, governments were present. Um, the, the only reason that I know um, that he had a meeting with lenders um, was through um, a, a parliamentary answer um, uh, that was given and through discussions with uh, my officials, with UK government officials, rather than any direct communication. Now, in order to look at all of this in the round, uh, which will allow me to balance what we need to do, um, would be, first of all, to get an idea of what can be done um, in terms of those insuring, uh, insurance and lending issues um, which um, are reserved. Uh, a good first step in all of this um, would be uh, a four-nation approach uh, and discussions about the nature of the problems that we are all facing, uh, the issues that we need to resolve, and what shared action to we, can we take to resolve this. Um, again, you know, I would reiterate, insurance and lend are, are both UK-wide issues. Um, they're reserved. But we have a shared interest um, in terms uh, of safety and protecting people's lives, their homes, their investments. Um, so, at the very least, you know, let's all sit down together to see what the shared interests are and what can we do to resolve some of these difficulties. Uh, can I thank the minister for that? And my final point would be, I suppose, that. Having listened to this stuff now for many months, and having heard the minister say that, for example, the ESW1 form was brought in without any consultation, thereby um, not allowing for people with the expertise to um, do the inspections which are required, and also ministers in the UK government have meetings to which they exclude the devolved administrations, I'm a wee bit sceptical that we might end up in six months' time exactly the same place, saying where is the UK in all of this. But Setting that to one side, if it was to be a legislative process, does the minister have any idea how long that might take? Uh, that is how long is a piece of string, convener. Um, you know, first of all, um, you know, uh, we would have to consult around about uh, any uh, legislative pr proposals if that was what was required. Um, you know, it may well be that during that process. Uh, we find uh, other unintended consequences. Um, you know, for me, um, I think that the best way to do all of this um, is uh, uh, combined efforts to find a solution uh, before uh, jumping to to legislation. Um, I, I, I'm quite sure, um, you know, that ministers um, across these islands uh, want to find a solution to this. Um, let's work together to, to uh, what we can do uh, to cooperate um, to find a process which may not be a universal process because it may have to um, take account uh, of uh, different legislation in different parts of the UK. Um, you know, I've talked about a universal process for Scotland. It may not be a universal process uh, for the whole of the UK, but let's see if we can find a process that works for all. Um, uh, in order to, to bring this forward, um, you know, uh, it is in all of our interests, I think, uh, to help the folks out there, whether they be in Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, or Wales, that are finding difficulties at this moment um, in terms of selling on their properties. Um, and you know, this should be um, a, a priority um, for all uh, to find those solutions for people, or. Um, you know, we may find as we move on, um, you know, other impacts um, on um, the housing market and the buying and selling of homes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy Balfour. 
Uh, uh, good morning, um, and it's nice to be back. Um, and good morning to you, Minister. Minister, I suppose I'd like to take this one in a slightly talking about buildings that have been built and are now trying to be sold. My understanding from uh, a number of different conversations is that there are buildings still being built today, which do, which could fall into this trap around um, the issue we've been talking about. And I wonder what is the government doing in regard to regulations and particularly building standards to stop buildings which haven't yet been completed, perhaps falling into this trap in the future. Um, uh, Convener, I may bring in Mr. Garvin for some of the technical aspects on on this, uh, and then I will come back um, and answer uh, some aspects of Mr. Balfour's question myself. But on the technicalities around about um, the Act uh, and the regulation regulation changes, um, let's hear from Mr. Garvin first. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, uh, as members uh, probably remember, we brought in uh, new requirements last year around the uh, cladding, fire performance of cladding, uh, so that any building above 11 metres should be uh, either non-combustible cladding or, or alternatively, uh, could be approved through BS 8414 route. Um, that, that was a a uh, significant step in reducing the trigger height from 18 metres uh, down to uh, 11 metres. Uh, as the Minister uh, said at the uh, introduction uh, to the committee, uh, we uh, will set up a further review panel and uh, look at the issue of some of the uh, most high-risk materials, particularly metal composite materials, uh, and how we can uh, ensure that they are not used uh, in the, the cladding of buildings. Uh, as part of that, uh, we also will look at the role of BS 8414. Uh, it's recently been uh, updated, and a, a latest version of that uh, published by the uh, British Standards Institution. Uh, so we'll look at that. Uh, those, those changes should be improvements to the, the previous standard, but we'll uh, look at it in light of uh, a lot of evidence that's, that's come around, particularly test evidence uh, in, in this area. Minister. Uh, th thank you, Convener. I thought that um, maybe Mr Garvin was going to talk a little bit more about the Act, but uh, uh, what we uh, have here um, in Scotland is the ability um, with the Act that was put in place to change regulation on a regular basis, uh, which has not happened um, uh, south of the border. Uh, and what we will continue to do um, is to review everything um, as we move forward, um, in particular um, uh, in light of uh, evidence that comes to us. Um, you know, I, I said earlier, and Mr. Garvin. Um, has uh, just uh, reiterated that that I put a, a review panel back, an independent review panel back in place uh, to look all metal composite materials. Um, in terms of changes um, that we bring forward, um, you know, uh, on Monday I think it is, uh, I will sign the statutory instrument um, to bring. Uh, uh, our sprinkler systems uh, into play in many uh, other homes, including all new build social housing um, from next year, part of the um, proposal that David Stewart put forward. So we continue to adapt. What I would be interested in, um, Mr. Balfour has said that his understanding is that some buildings that are being built now may fall into a trap. What I would be interested in, um, and not here because I, I think that it would be inappropriate to do so, but to hear from Mr. Um, uh, from Jeremy exactly where um, uh, he has this information from, uh, and what that information is, so that we can look at that and respond to him accordingly. Um, because 
um, like Mr. Balfour and everyone else, um, I don't want anybody falling into any traps, as he put it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. I, 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 I will correspond. Hold on, Mr. Jeremy, on you go, Jeremy. Uh, I, I, I mean, I will, I will come, I will, I will come back to you um, with that. But I, I suppose if I can just push you or your fishers a wee bit, are, are you confident that any build, any flat building being built today is not being built with materials that could be seen as cladding? Have you got that confidence? What I, what I would say, convener, um, is it should be complying uh, with building regulations. Now, building regulations, of course, are not retrospective, but buildings that are being built at this moment should be complying with building regula regulations. Now, one of the things which I would say to uh, Mr. Balfour and to the committee um, is that Homes for Scotland um, are on the working group. Um, my understanding um, is that at the last session, um, Nicola Barclay, um, who is the uh, head of Homes for Scotland, um, are, are, has said that uh, builders are cognizant uh, of all that is going on um, and are adapting accordingly. But I would reiterate this again and again. You know, every single building that is being built in Scotland at this moment should comply with building regulations uh, when that building was signed off. Now, you know, again, that's not retrospective. Uh, and what I can also assure the committee um, is that uh, I and my officials uh, will continue um, to look at the evidence. Uh, and we'll take the necessary steps uh, to um, scrutinise uh, what is going on out there. We will use independent expertise, um, and we will uh, adapt and change our building regulations accordingly. Okay, um, I think time is against me, but maybe one quick question, uh, Community, just before I. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to go, or, or my time comes to an end. Uh, and that is around this 18, 11 metre um, issue. Um, I have been contacted by um, at least two or three constituents here in Lothian who um, are having problems selling uh, their property, and they are below that 11 metre um, issue. Now, I appreciate that is an issue for the lenders and for the insurers. But in any review that you're carrying out, and any working group that you're carrying out, is it your remit to look at all properties, or are you simply looking at properties over 11 or 18 metres? Because there's a danger here that we get a resolution for taller buildings, but then we just fall back into a situation that um, those that are under 11 metres then aren't able to sell. Uh, convener, I, I'm concerned about all buildings, um, no matter how high or low um, they may be. Um, I think, like Mr. Balfour, um, I've had uh, situations in my own constituency uh, whereby folks who are in buildings below 18 metres have been told that they require um, the EWS1 form. Um, in one of the cases, um, that matter has been um, resolved. Um, I think uh, we should look at what um, uh, what EWS one uh, said to begin with, which was over 18 metres. That was what was put in play. Um, but there, again, you know, the lenders themselves. Uh, it's up to them how they deal with all of this. Um, and you know, again, this is the, the difficulty uh, where you know individual lenders um, are taking individual decisions around about this, and this is why you know again I would say that a universal agreement around about this process um, is uh, required. Um, Mr. Balfour can be assured, um, you know, that that will form 
uh, part of the discussions in the working group, because what is required is the clarity about when that form is used. Okay, thank you very much for that. I suppose just just on the well tangentially from what Jeremy was talking about there, you'll have, you're all <coughs> excuse me received a letter from the local authorities building standards, and I was just wondering from that if, what role you think that the building standards officer have to play uh, in preventing houses with the wrong sort of cladding getting built, and are you satisfied this is happening in Portugal? Um, obviously, um, building standards has a, a part to play in terms of the uh, verification of all committee previously. Um, you know that we will continue to re review the role of building standards um, in Scotland. Uh, we're looking um, closely um, as well at what um, is coming forward south of the border uh, in terms of their new bill. Um, uh, some of which uh, will have a, a, an impact on what we do here, um, and you know I'm more than willing to keep the committee up to speed around about that. Um, and also, um, you know, we will continue uh, to look um, at what comes out um, of the Grenfell inquiry. Uh, we have moved very swiftly here in Scotland. Uh, to change the way that we do things and to change regulation um, in light of the Grenfell tragedy. Uh, and we will continue uh, to look at evidence that is done uh, and to take appropriate action. Um, I recognise that the committee um, received a fairly comprehensive letter um, from labs I think uh, I was helpful in garnering that response because I act actually uh, wrote to labs because they hadn't responded to the committee. If there are any aspects uh, of that highly um, uh, detailed response that the committee has, I'm more than willing to answer in writing individually any points uh, that the committee may have. Okay, I appreciate that, Minister. Thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm now going to ask Liam Simpson if he has any questions. I've got a few, convener. How long have I got? Uh, you've got about thirty seconds. But <laughs> uh, just a couple of minutes. You've got a few, maybe say four minutes, five minutes. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, um, I hear what the minister is saying about the need for a full nation approach, and I can see why that would be uh, useful. Um, in that we do have um, movement between countries, so there's a housing market that operates uh, across the UK. Um, but of course, we have a separate Scottish housing system, so I think you know there are fixes that could be done here. Can I just ask, um, in in terms of the the remedial fund set up by the UK government. I wasn't really clear what the minister was saying there. Is he asking for that to be extended to Scotland or was he saying that he's looking to set up a separate fund here? Um, what I, I said, and I, I don't think I could have been much plainer to be honest with you, um, is that I'm uh, sympathetic uh, to those who have called uh, for the Scottish government to set up a fund. Um, and I'm open to this. However, as I quite clearly stated, um, I, my expectation uh, would be that those who have a responsibility to put their hands in their pooches, their pockets first, um, as Taylor Wimpy have done with Glasgow Harbour. Uh, I would say that Glasgow Harbour, uh, as I pointed out previously, um, uh, are the only domestic properties in Scotland that were um, extensively clad. Um, with ACMPE. Um, others, uh, other buildings um, have some, uh, 23 domestic buildings have uh, some uh, ACMPE. Uh, and my expectation there would be that the, the developers of these buildings uh, again follow the line of Taylor Wimpy um, and uh, you know, uh, sort that out. Uh, beyond that, you know, we will look uh, the base use of taxpayers' money, um, uh, 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 you know, because we want to target money to effectively 
um, help people where that's required. But of course, one of the things which we actually need to do um, is to find out the circumstances um, in uh, some of these cases anyway. Okay, thanks. Um, so one of the issues that the, that the committee's picked up on is that we, when we look at buildings, we don't know whether they've actually been built in, a, in accordance with building regulations. Um, so this is an, an historic issue, you're well aware of it. Um, so is it, w would it not be better to do a comprehensive inventory of all buildings in Scotland so that we know exactly what exactly what is on the buildings? And is there not a role for councils to do that work and we can involve labs uh, in, in that? Because at the moment, we just don't know. We don't know what is on every building. Uh, convener, we have done a comprehensive high-rise inventory for the first time ever. That has not been easy um, to do in any way, shape or form. Uh, in doing that inventory, um, we uh, found uh, another two buildings uh, that had partial uh, ACMPE. So, you know, that work in itself has led to the discovery um, of another couple of buildings uh, which uh, have uh, that on it. Um, and of course, the uh, inventory itself um, is to be updated annually um, around about change. I don't know what Mr. Simpson um, is driving at in terms of a more comprehensive in inventory. You know, I'm more, I'm more than willing um, to 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 hear um, suggestions in that front, or for Mr. Simpson or other members um, to 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 get a briefing uh, around about the the work that we have done uh, with the cooperation. Um, of the local authorities. Thank you, Rather than questioning you further, I think that would be useful to hear how that inventory was actually done, whether it was a, a paper-based exercise or involved people actually going out and having a look. Um, kind of final question, convener, if that's okay. Um, we've got uh, a ban uh, on com combustible materials being used uh, in buildings, um, in cladding in England and Wales, um, and now it uh, seems to be coming in in Northern Ireland. And I've asked you about this before, Minister. So Scotland's an outlier on this. You did hint earlier that you might be prepared to you know, reconsider this. Is there a time scale for that work? Um, convener, I, I, I never hint. Um, I, I'm not prone to hinting, I have to say. Um, what we have done, um, and I, I should correct Mr Simpson, uh, because what um, uh, has happened south of the border um, is uh, that folks are not allowed to use combustible material on buildings over 18 metres, uh, and they've moved to A1, A2. Uh, and what are independent um, uh, fire review panel uh, came back with uh, was uh, to uh, not a full scale uh, ban on that over uh, in buildings over 80 metres, uh, but um, a situation uh, whereby if there was a BS8414 full scale fire test to test all of the system, um, then that could proceed. And I think that BS8414, which is being improved, um, uh, that full-scale test um, is extremely important. Now, um, I, uh, in terms of the hint, which is not a hint, uh, what has come to my attention um, is uh, uh, more advice, uh, expert advice, uh, around about other metal composite materials. So not ACM, but other metal composite materials. Um, and because I've caught sight uh, of some of that, um, I have asked 
for the fire uh, for uh, fire safety review group to come into play again to look at all aspects of that. Uh, one of the things which I have heard um, and you know um, it is worrying is that the use of some materials, um, uh, which may be these materials may be okay, but some of them are prone to discoloration quite quickly. Um, and if they're repainted, for example, um, that can cause real difficulties. Now, in light of some of that, that I've heard and some of the other evidence that I've seen, I've asked for the reconvening of that to look at all of that very carefully. Again, um, you know, I think we need to look at this um, as the whole system approach. Uh, we can see from the Grenfell inquiry, you know, while a huge amount of the emphasis was on the, the panelling, you know, other big mistakes were made there, um, which caused real difficulty. We need to look at all of this in the round. And that's why I think that full scale fire tests BS eight four one four um are more important um uh, than uh, many uh, of the other aspects of looking at individual things. That's not to say that we will not look at individual aspects of this. And you know, what I think the committee recognises, I'm sure, is that as we have progressed here, we have moved further and faster and most things, taking independent advice as we move forward and being um, uh, uh, very, very careful in all of we, that we do, because I want people to be as safe as they possibly can be in their homes. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, and it was nice to see the Simpson and Minister double act back again. Uh, can I just finish off by asking, we've been talking about the EWS forum pretty much, the whole meeting. But it's come across from you, Minister, that the, the crux of the matter is the decisions are made by uh, by companies that uh, can profit from it. Is there any suggestion at all that some people might be benefiting from the EW1, the EWS1 process at the cost of their, uh, the, the householders, the expense of the householders? I have no evidence of that, um, convener. Um, I'm more than willing to uh, uh, have any evidence that anybody has, or even an evidence of that. But you know, that's something that we can uh, explore uh, as we move forward. Um, but yeah, I don't have any evidence of that. Okay, right. Thank you very much for that. In that case, uh, that completes the question. Concludes this evidence session. And I thank the Minister and his official for taking part in this meeting. I will now suspend briefly, and briefly means two minutes, to allow a witness changeover. Broadcast will stop recording at this point. Okay, thank you very much.
Agenda item four is consideration of the draft rent arrears pre-action requirements coronavirus Scotland regulations 2020. The committee will first take evidence of the instrument, and I welcome again Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, along with Yvette Shepherd, Team Leader, Better Home Scottish Government, and James Hamilton, Solicitor, Housing and Local Government, Scottish Government. This instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve it before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda, agenda item to consider the motion to approve the instrument. I invite the minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, convener, and thanks once again for allowing me to do this today um, as part of uh, your consideration of our draft regulations uh, to bring in pre-action protocols uh, that will apply in rent arrears cases um, in the private rented sector. Uh, the last few months have been challenging uh, with the coronavirus outbreak, having significant implications for everyone, uh, including for the many people who have rented accommodation. Uh, in responding to the outbreak, uh, we have been clear that taking, uh, taking eviction action against a tenant uh, because they have suffered financial hardship due to coronavirus should always be a last resort. Um, instead, we want landlords to be flexible with their tenants, uh, signposting them to the range of financial support that is available uh, to help prevent rent arrears, and working with their tenants to manage any arrears that do occur. Uh, we introduced legislation to protect renters from eviction, uh, and we have made most grounds for evictions discretionary to ensure that the tribunal considers the reasonableness of granting an eviction order at this time. Uh, we have now confirmed our intention to lay regulations that will, uh, subject to the, uh, their being uh, approved by Parliament, uh, extend uh, those protections to the end of March 2021. Uh, we also want to further uh, strengthen uh, protection for tenants who find themselves in rent arrears at this time uh, by making sure that the landlord, landlords work with them uh, to manage those arrears before taking uh, steps uh, to seek eviction. Uh, and for this reason, uh, we have introduced legislation that allows for pre action requirements to be brought in uh, that will apply to private landlords seeking to evict a tenant for rent arrears. Uh, compliance with these pre actions uh, will form part of the discretionary consideration of the tribunal in such cases. Uh, the regulations the committee is considering today. Uh, set out these pre-action requirements, giving clear direction to landlords and the steps they must take in advance of seeking an eviction uh, order for rent arrears. Uh, and they have been drafted with input from stakeholders and are established to inform our, uh, 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 and uh, you know will inform us as we move forward. The introduction of the requirements is welcomed across all sectors. Uh, with agreement that they will play a role in sustaining tenancies at this time, uh, which is beneficial for tenants and landlords. Uh, and I look forward to your questions, Convener. Thank you very <coughs> much. Uh, number of questioners. Uh, Sarah, would you like to kick off? Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, can I just first say that I do very much welcome that we have this. Uh, regulation in front of us today. So I'd like a couple of questions about clarity. Um, we've had a briefing from Shelter. I don't know if the minister has seen it, um, but they have asked about information that would be available to tenants in advance of a rent tier tribunal, which sounds like a reasonable request. Um, and I think it's about a being able to test the reasonable of reasonableness of a decision by a landlord. So, given that this is in front of us today and we can't amend it, is there a way that the minister could communicate uh, that reasonable request both to um, landlords, maybe through the Scottish Association, or um, to rent tier tribunals as well, so that we get maximum um, support for tenants and they can see clarity um, if they have to go to a rent tier tribunal? Uh, convener, I haven't seen um, uh, the briefing from Shelter. Um, I can assure the committee, committee that I'll have a look at it. 
um, and we'll consider um, what is in that briefing. I, I would say I, 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 it would be dishonest of me not to say, um, you know, in terms of uh, dealing with the tribunal, uh, it would be uh, I would be unable to direct, and I'm always a bit sweared um, of anything that may look like instruction. Uh, which I can't do to a tribunal. But what I would say to the committee is I'll look at what shelter has put forward um, and, and I'll consider um, what, what is being said there. Um, and I'll write back to the committee uh, with uh, a decision uh, and the reason for my decision and all of that. Um, what I would also say um, to the committee um, in general is you know, I've tried my best um, uh, throughout all of this, to uh, let tenants know exactly what their rights are. Um, you know, I've written to every private rented sector tenant um, in Scotland around about rights and signed posting them to help. And I want to do as much as I can um, to ensure that tenants know um, their rights as we move forward. And welcome. Am I allowed to? Okay. Right. Just. One supplementary. It was just to say, I welcome that response from the minister. Um, I think a key thing would be monitoring the implementation and the effectiveness of pre-action requests. And if you could commit to that, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, con convener, I, I will commit to monitoring all of this um, as we as we move forward. Um, I think it is absolutely essential um, that we gather up. Uh, as much data as possible uh, as we move forward to see what the impacts on people's lives actually are. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, Andy, I believe you've got a number of questions. Uh, it would be good if you could uh, put a couple of them together, if, you, if it's possible, to ask the Minister. I'll do my best, best convener. Thanks very much. Um, at the stage two of the um, Coronavirus 2 Bill uh, in this committee, uh, Minister, you said that um, to ensure that the regulations will be effective and workable, we will work with stakeholders, including Mr. Whiteman, representatives of landlords and tenants, to develop them. Uh, and you say in the policy uh, note that the government's consulted with a range of stakeholders. Have you consulted with private tenants? Uh, we've been co uh, consulted with the private rented sector resilience group, which was established um, uh, to inform the government during the course of the pandemic. And as I've said to um, uh, Mr. Whiteman, before in an answer in the chamber, I think, if I remember rightly, I may be wrong. It might have been a committee. Um, uh, uh, we have, I know, folks there who are private rented sector tenants. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked in response to a question from Sarah Boyk there about the importance of monitoring. Um, shelter have been monitoring the evictions in the social sector for some years, and in their 2016 report into evictions by social landlords, they found that despite the policy intention and broad buy-in across the sector, pre-action requirements have not had a sustained long-term impact in reducing evictions. What makes you think that the uh, introducing them in the private sector will make any difference? Um, convener, as you can well imagine, I don't have the shelter report from 2016 in front of me at uh, present. Um, what I would say um, is that across the uh, public sector, um, pre-action protocols are seen by many um, as uh, the right way um, of uh, moving forward uh, and communicating uh, with tenants and have uh, stopped um, a, a large amount of uh, evictions, um, which I think is extremely important. Um, I can look at the 2016 shelter report, but I would say that that's four years old now. Um, but you know, from from the anecdote uh, and from discussions that I have, um, pre-action protocols, including constituency um, cases, I would say, um, pre-action pl protocols seem to work in in many cases. Um, so you know, I'll look at 2016. I'll have further discussion um, with Mr. Whiteman if he wants offline. Um, but you know it, that is a report that's four years old. Um, right, just I'll just wrap my final question into one. Um, so first of all, you also said at stage two that you would um, 
consider uh, making these permanent in the private sector. I'm just yeah. wondering if you're thinking as well from that. Uh, and secondly, in the social sector, the, the, the instrument says that in complying with the pre-action requirements, the landlord must have regard to any guidance issued by the Scottish ministers. That's on the social uh, side. There's no requirement for any statutory guidance uh, in the private, um, in the ones before us today. Was there a reason for that? Um, I, I don't think there was any reason for that. Uh, what I would say to uh, Mr Whiteman is at stage two, I did say to him uh, that we would be looking to make this permanent. Um, I've got officials uh, working on that. Um, and we'll also take cognizance of what he's just said around about guidance um, uh, if we decide uh, to make this permanent, which I, I think we will. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I did say at stage two we would look to make this permanent. I have officials working on that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Uh, and a final question from Jeremy Balfour. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this is a, a slight uh, tangent to what we're talking about, but it, it, I think it's a, a consequence of what we have introduced. Is I've had a number of constituents who were hoping to carry out uh, work to their property who had um, the appropriate warrant in place, um, but because of the um, ability not to evict the tenant, they haven't been able to carry out the work and thus they're going to have to reapply for all the work. Would the Minister just have a look at this? If it's going to continue on the non eviction for a number of months, there are going to be a number of people who had planned to do work to their property. Um, but now are not able to do that. And would you look at that with his office officers to see anything can be done? Um, convener, um, you know, if any member wants to send me any casework that they have to try and uh, look at to resolve situations, I will. Um, however, um, you know, um, we have put um, all of this in for the protection of people. I'm quite sure that solutions can be found um, uh, in terms of looking at building warrants or other things. But you know, in order for me to look at some of these things, which may be anomalies, um, you know, I have to see them first. And it's not anything that's crossed my desk thus far. And there have been a lot of uh, a lot of communication on this front. It has to be said. Yeah, okay. That's an interesting point that Jeremy raised, right enough. But thanks very much for that, uh, Minister. Okay, no more questions. So, <coughs> excuse me. The the question therefore is uh, that motion S five M two two four one seven in the name of the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning be approved. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, that is agreed. The committee will report on this instrument in due course, and I invite the committee to delegate authority to me as convener to approve a draft of the report for publication. That concludes the public part of this meeting, and we will resume the meeting in private on Microsoft Teams. And I propose we take a five-minute comfort break. Please accept the clerk's meeting request for the private discussion, which will be sent shortly. You can exit the meeting by clicking on the red telephone icon. Thank you for everybody for the participation so far. Thank you.